I was an overseas scholar from Mount Allison, 1955, 1956. And it certainly wasn't a fortunate thing for me to be able to get such a scholarship. Just to have the joy of living in London for a year, uh, that alone was worth the whole thing. Uh, I, my, <clears throat> I, got to, to, I had direct experience with Lord Beaverbrook in this way. In 19, 1954, I went to England on a Wisp scholarship. And I was fascinated by Marble Arch, Hyde Park Corner, where the speakers would go and stand on their soap boxes and, or other boxes and, and uh, go on and uh, have something to say. So there were 15 of us traveling. I said, wouldn't it be nice? We should go back up. We'd be gone to see it. We should go back up and have fun. And why didn't we should come and speak? We'd have an audience here of 10 or 12, and we have three people willing to speak, and so we could have some fun here. And then we were to meet Sunday afternoon. I was the only speaker who turned up. The others chickened out, I think. So I re rented a chair for four pence <clears throat> and uh, then proceeded to denounce everything British I could think of. Because if you were to get a crowd, get an audience, you had to really insult these people, like they should adopt a moral foreign policy like that of John Foster Dulles. That's how far back it goes. Anyway, uh, I, I, I had no trouble. I had 300 people. They were just denouncing me for, for British people, having fun. So I went back to England on the scholarship the next year, and I said, wouldn't it be fun if we went back and did the same thing again? And my roommate, Mark Bain, he uh, was there, and uh, he said, well, I can't come up and hear, hear you today, Wendell, because I'm having tea with Arnold P. Brown, who was the secretary of the Beaverbrook Trust, a very morose-looking man, Coots Bank. But uh, Mark couldn't come because they were having tea. And it was Mr. Brown who gave us our money when we got off the boat, gave us 112 pounds, 10 shillings. So uh, I, it, it was a, it, so Mark couldn't come, and I said, that's all right. So I did the same thing. I had been guests to come back from Czechoslovakia and, and denounced the left-wingers in the crowd and had, had great fun and so on. So I was in full flight denouncing everything British I could think of. I looked down, and there was my roommate, with Arnold P. Brown in tow. I don't know who was Secretary of the Beaverbrook Trust. I don't know who, who I thought would have the stroke first, Arnold P. or myself. Anyway, you had to carry on. You just had to carry on. You couldn't be abject and get down. So I carried on another five minutes. I went up and, and uh, shook hands with Arnold P. Brown. And it was a limp handshake. And he looked right through me. And uh, so about three weeks later, Beaverbrook had us into his apartment, in one of his apartments in London, Arlington House. And uh, we were all led, dutifully led up to see, uh, to meet his lordship. And I was led up, and Beaverbrook looked at me, and he said, oh, Fulton, I must come up and hear you in the park sometime. And uh, I didn't know what to say. I was thought they might send us, send me home, having said, taken this anti-British stance. What I should have realized was, that this is just the sort of mischievous act that he, he took pleasure in. He, loved, he was a mischievous fellow indeed. And uh, so that was my one-on-one -on -one with Lord Beaverbrook. One of the interesting things about living in England at the time were the newspapers. There were six newspapers in the morning. But Lord Beaverbrook's Daily Express, of course, had a circulation of four million, uh, the greatest circulation in the free world at that time. And he, he, he had a lifelong aversion to dullness. He hated things being dull. And his idea of having an, an interesting thing with, it would be to invite eight or nine people into his, uh, one of his various houses and, uh, and have, so that, all with different opinions. And their great rows would take place at these tables and so on. And Beaverbrook liked it, liked it very much. Uh, one of the interesting things I find was that how he described the, the purpose of his newspapers for his own propaganda. And other, other people had come in with the media, people, very poor newspapers, to lead, lead to the public, lead in education and so on. Beaverbrook was very proud of the fact that his was, his, 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 that his was uh, uh, for propaganda and he didn't think twice about it. Uh, one of the interesting, nice things that Beaverbrook did, or Lady Beaverbrook, in 1926, Lady Beaverbrook brought, brought to England 15 high school teachers 
for three weeks and looked after them. Can't you imagine some of them coming from those poor, some very poor schools and so on, arriving at the heart of a, the heart of empire, as Beaverbrook would call it, and there they were exposed to, to London. What a, what a generous act that was, and so on. And, and Lady Beaverbrook at that time, of course, took charge of them, and, and they were traveled in very high circles. He had, had one, he had some one interaction, Beaverbrook had some interaction with students here at the, at the university. And he brought over, to, for, for the lecture, I think it was in the fall, Arnold A.J.P. Taylor, who was, very, who was a very formidable uh, historian, and of course, we Be were great friends of Beaverbrook, and he wrote uh, a biography of Beaverbrook, and so on. He didn't think that the students were paying enough attention to what A.J.P. Taylor was saying. So he pointed out to them that he had brought this man over at considerable expense. The least they could do was listen to him. <laughs> so the other thing, too, of course, the university itself, I think, is, has some sensitivities about it. They had to get a new president. The other president had gone away. And uh, Beaverbrook knew some people, knew St. John. He knew the Mackays, of course, and he ended up Basically, almost hiring Mackay right on the spot to come and be the to be the to be the uh, pre pre it was president or chancellor. I guess it was president. No, whatever, whichever it was. The upshot was that the the faculty was very annoyed by this, very very upset, and said so. His lordship, in a rage, just resigned as chancellor of the University of New Brunswick. Uh, what to do? You can't have this. This had to be repaired. And it was repaired in another, in, in this simple way. Uh, they, they, he became, he had, uh, he, he, they made, the legislature made him uh, an, an, an honorary citizen of, of New Brunswick. He did that. <coughs> and, uh, and also, they, they quickly gave up uh, the faculty. Interestingly enough, the minutes of the faculty meetings have never been found. Go through the archives. I have. I hadn't, couldn't find them. And uh, then Beaverbrook came, and then the, the legislature, the Brunswick legislature, met and uh, and made Beaverbrook honorary chancellor for life. And so, it, uh, but I, I'm sure that A.J.P. Taylor must have been amused. Be told to, to, to the students to shave up there and listen to him. 